take it for granted that we always guarantee to tomorrow and we're never going to have obstacles. But my life changed in four seconds. It can change in four seconds. Final action, Dan Parker from Salem, Alabama, burns out, gets the height, nice and hot for traction. Dan Parker driving for Bill George, always tough when he comes out and racing the ADRL. Beat Shannon Jenkins here two years ago in the final, looking to go to the finals again. Does it, 399, he goes the first ever three. That's our uh, second career best pass, so uh, we're tickled to death, we're tickled to death. Just like you said, you came out and tested, went 401 and 399, and, we, and, and you and just we, went we 401 and 399? Yeah, we struggled a little bit, and uh, we got after it, and I got the best car in the world, Bill George, I want to thank him. He, uh, he gives me the opportunity to drive his thing, and I don't get to help as much as I should at home, but uh, he brings me a, a killer piece. When I come track, I know it's ready. I was born into a racing family. My father has raced since he was 16 years old. My mom was eight months pregnant with me and going to the drag strip and still racing some. When I was eight years old, there was an all motorcycle race and dad entered me in the mini bike class and I come in second place. Every now and then dad might bring a car over and I'd, he'd let me make a pass in it. And so I started driving faster and faster things. And I started working on race cars, then I got my first Mustang, and it was downhill from there. The accident was March 31st, 2012. If I would have been further back in the qualifying line, probably wouldn't have had a wreck that day because rain would have come in. It was getting cloudy, and it seemed like we were going to have some bad weather. When he took off from the starting line, the car shook a little bit and bobbed a little bit, and he had always been able to pull out of that in the past. As he was going through the eighth mile, the car turned hard right. I saw the car hard turn, go straight for the wall, and it was just airborne, 100, I mean, 175, 180 miles an hour. And then when we get there, it's, it's the worst, worst imaginable thing you can deal with. I saw the car, and then I saw pieces of it laying everywhere. The motor had just come completely out of it. They were going to life flight them out, but the storm was coming through and they couldn't. So um, they ended up having to send him to UAB by ambulance. When the doctor came out, she did tell us in the very beginning, she said, we won't know the extent of his injuries until he wakes up. He was opening his eyes, his pupils and his irises were black and his eyes were bloodshot. The glasses he wore at the racetrack were gone. Nobody could find them. Not even the frames, they were gone. So he had another pair that he wore when he would work out in the shop. So I grabbed those um, and he asked uh, to put them on. And when he put them on, he just, he fell apart. He couldn't see anything. They didn't help. So he just fell apart. You won't feel it right away. Yeah. A lot of people have asked me that. They can't believe that I'm still around. And it was never, leaving was never an option. He needed me. But it was, at the same time, I don't know, I, I just, I, there's just no way, no other way to say it except I, I loved him and I just, there was just no leaving. I told her, I said, you know, I've ruined my life. Don't ruin yours trying to do the right thing and take care of me, just, you know, because I remember that exactly. That's the one thing I do remember from the hospital. Most of it was a blur. 
I kept threatening her. If she didn't get me out of there, I was going to call a cab and get the home. <laughs> like I could even call a cab or pay for it or even knew where I was up was to tell him to come get me. <laughs> so we just kept talking about stuff and, and he just told me that it was that I needed to leave because nothing good was going to come out of this and that... Um, I understood. And uh, he, he understood if, if I left and never came back. You know, it ain't easy. And, and, you know, that's the thing about with Jennifer. And people see me and all this and all that. Well, they don't see me on my bad days. Jennifer has been here for me for every one of my bad days. My worries today are different. How am I going to survive? How am I going to be 65, 70 years old on a disability and try to take care of myself? It's a totally different worry today. I have to, I have to, you know, make my own future. Basically, I got to figure out something. Working on these two hands is all. I, I really, that's all I've ever had, and that's more likely all I've ever going to be. You know, so I got to figure out something there to do it. You know, part of it is an enjoyment. I, I love learning something new, but you know, a big factor of it is I got to figure out a way to start trying to make a dollar, trying to you know get some income and so uh, having a niche product um, is you know a good opportunity for me and it keeps me thinking keeps me creative you know what I've done my whole life building race cars and always trying to think ahead and you know improve on something so this sort of helps you know this is sort of pushing me a little bit um, both to try to you know, make some money, but also to, to push my mind to keep creating. Saturday morning downtown Columbus is a venue for people to be able to sell arts and crafts and fruits and vegetables. And so today I'm buying my license, hoping that I'll have a booth set up with the right traffic and to be able to uh, showcase my lamps and other woodworking stuff I plan on doing in the future. yesterday it's Dan's blind ambition mm -hmm. I thought that was a great business name because I thought it was like I didn't know you were actually blind but I thought blind ambition meant like you started doing these projects and you were just hoping <laughs> it went well yeah, yeah I'm completely blind so um, I see your check do you want me if you can if you can yeah. fill it out mm -hmm. and then I'll sign it after you fill it out sure all right I'm gonna sh put my finger where you need to sign so here's the pen Okay. And then my finger is the start of, yep. Go in this direction. You're going, I'm gonna not put your pretend on, go in that direction. Okay. That's perfect. Okay. Okay, so let me give you your receipt. There you go. Okay, well, thank you so much. And you're all set. Good deal, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, we're excited to have you. We always had motorcycles, dirt bikes, mini bikes, everything. And we would go out riding in the country and I would ride on the gas tank and my brother Chris would ride on the back behind dad. Typical brothers, we would fight and argue, but if somebody tried to come pick on the other one, we had each other's back. She loved vintage motorcycle road racing and the Bonneville Salt Flats. Chris was an amazingly talented person, but he fought depression 
most of his adult life. He just committed a slow suicide. He drank himself to death. Six months or so after the wreck, I was laying in bed asleep and I was thinking about Chris and it hit me that, you know, I could race the salt flats. It's wide, it's long, it's straight. That's probably about two o'clock in the morning. I just sat there all night thinking about it. I think Jennifer woke up about eight o'clock that morning. As soon as she woke up, I rolled over to her. I said, I know what I'm gonna do. I figured it out. She said, what? I said, I'm gonna race the Bonneville Salt Flats. So I started building a motorcycle and it just evolved. That gave me a purpose. That gave me something to think about during the day, to wake up and to reach outside and research and talk to people and set a goal. People were donating parts and money and labor. And I had it 75% finished before I even had permission I was gonna race it. Three weeks before the race, we went to North Alabama to an airstrip, tested the first guidance system, and it was just way too much information, way too slow. Talked to Patrick, decided how to simplify it. He went home, rewrote all the software. The next week, we met again at the, the airport, and the first time I cranked the motorcycle, I went from one end of the airport to the other by myself. I wasn't going fast, but I kept it out of the ditches. The best thing that, that was for me was that motorcycle. It, it, it truly saved me because it gave me a purpose to keep on living and, and to push myself. When it was time to name the motorcycle, we named it the Christopher Scott Special after my brother. When I first thought about it, I said it'd be a two or three year project. Here it is a year later, the time I started, and I'm at the Salt Flats. They didn't want to let Dan go. Oh my gosh, there's gonna be a blind guy at Bonneville. He's gonna wreck and die, and we're gonna get sued. I don't remember who it was that came over and basically said, you're done. You're not gonna be able to race anymore. Without having a license, you're not fulfilling our contract to, to get you here. And, and of course, Dan being Dan, he says, I got a license. Whips it out, shows it to him. He says, it's not expired. He said, have you um, gotten a letter stating it's revoked? I said, not that I've seen. <laughs> and he, he started laughing. And, and, and I had a pair of sunglasses. And uh, he says, it says, corrective eye lens is required. I slid my sunglasses down and again laughed. He said, who in the hell am I to say they're not corrective? <laughs> you could tell the people from Bub were just, just like, like the angels were singing, like, oh my gosh, we can still race. They, they knew this was government bureaucracy and they wanted to see me succeed. <laughs> what blind man has a driver's license? <laughs> and I honestly think he still renews it to this day. <laughs> Once you know, Jennifer gave me the signal through the two-way communication that track was clear and course was mine, it all went away. Went through the first mile and then entered the measured mile and then when the motorcycle shut off and I brought it to a stop, I was just bawling like a baby. <laughs> you know, just everything emotional I just hit me. That's a feeling people spend millions trying to get that feeling and to experience that is something so few get to do. <laughs> Every day's an Easter egg. <laughs> Somebody comes up and make us a, a bulk offer on all 10 lamps. <laughs> Got it? Yeah. 
much do you charge for them? They're 250 each. Uh -huh. With the electrical? Yeah. And I, I do everything myself. Uh-huh. Nobody helps me do anything. Most people that bought the lamps, you know, were halfway buying it just to help me out. I, I try to do things to prove to the world that, you know, I can do them, a blind man can do them. It goes back to the principle, you know, 60 to 70 percent of blind people are unemployed. And if somebody would work with them just a little bit, they might have to bend the way they do things just a little bit, but they would have an employee that would be a hell of a lot more dedicated than employees nowadays. This is something that most people just, they have no idea. This is the part that I miss the most. I, I get tired of people saying, I have to go do this. I'm tired of traffic. You know, Columbus, Georgia's traffic is this and all this and all that. I get so tired of hearing that. I'd give anything in the world to get to drive this car across town. You know. Me and take Jennifer, me and her go to the Sonic and me drive and pull up to get a chocolate shake. I'll never get to do that again. You can't live in a world of cotton balls. So if you live your life worried about everything, you're not gonna live. You're just, you're just taking up space. You're just breathing air. I always accepted the fact that I would come home beat up or in a box. I never imagined I'd come home blind. You know, that's just, that's just what racers do. To me, you know, this is just racing. You know, I've, I've raced my whole life. You know, I, I was, and I did metal fabrication my whole life. So, you know, this is just who I am. You know, I know to other people, it seems totally crazy, and totally stupid, but this is just a continuance of who I am. I just had to figure out another way to do it. And, you know, I know it seems crazy to some people, but to me, jumping out of a good running airplane is crazy, so I'm not going to do that, I promise. But uh, so it's just, it's all in perspective, how you look at things.